So we always like to do at Fortune, we call it the big get to know you. You weren't here um, yesterday morning where we went around the room with all these amazing women to uh, find out what they do. So we're going to start kind of at the beginning with you. Um, you were raised in Greensboro, North Carolina. Your mom was a school librarian. Your dad was a Baptist minister. What kind of influence did your mom leave with you? You talk about her, her you reference her quiet, uh, quiet defiance. What did you mean by that? Sure. My mom, who is, um, I'm very, very fortunate that I still have her. Yeah. She's 83 and doing well. She is the strongest person in our family, bar none. Um, and that says a lot to a woman who has uh, been married to a Baptist minister and dealt with church life yes, for over yes. 50 <laughs> years. Uh, but my mom was an English teacher and she became a librarian. Uh, and I think the biggest message that she gave me wasn't so much what she always said, but what I saw her do. Uh, when I was very young in elementary school, my mom actually left us for a summer to go finish her master's degree in library science. And so, you know, when you're a kid and you're, it's the summertime, you want your mom around and she's supposed to take you everywhere and do everything for you. And she was off and in school. Um, and she had always said education was important and she, she, by her actions, showed that to me. And of course, we were left to the devices of my father who fed us the most interesting breakfasts. Like what? You can ever imagine. Such as? One, well, you know, you're a kid, you're looking for cereal, maybe some cream of wheat. You know, the chicken leg and, and green beans was, <laughs> was just sort of like, hmm. And of course, we went to visit her once because it was a residential program. She wanted to focus and finish and we complained oh, what he's feeding us. And, and she was like, oh, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. And we thought, don't you care, don't you care? Um, but as I got older, what I realized was that she cared very much. And seeing her do that and seeing her say, this is what I need to do, um, getting this degree is important, not just for me, but for the whole family, was a very powerful message, as, as powerful as many of the stories that she shared with me about her growing up years. And speaking about doing what you need to do, and this segues into your, your life as Attorney General now, you had a grandfather who helped protect and hide blacks who were um, fleeing the clutches of the law, mm -hmm. as you said at one point. Sure. Describe that. Sure. Well, my, both my parents are from eastern North Carolina. They're both from small rural towns. Uh, they were both born in the 1930s. A very different time, a very different economy, a very different justice system from what we have now. And my dad used to tell me stories about my grandfather. My grandfather died when I was around five or six. And I remember him uh, very much as, as, uh, as, a very, as a great grandfather figure. Um, but he would tell me that when he was a kid in the 30s growing up, he remembered that when people got in trouble with the law, they would come to my grandfather for advice and for help. Um, and sometimes they needed to basically leave uh, and leave the area because the concern was that they would not get a fair trial. Uh, they wouldn't even get a fair hearing or a fair adjudication on the case, whatever it was. And my father remembers the sheriff, uh, who knew my grandfather very well. My grandfather was a minister in the small town. He had built a church right beside the house um, and was, was well known. Um, and the sheriff would come by and talk to my grandfather and say, you know, we're looking for so-and-so. Have you seen so-and-so? And my grandfather would say, haven't seen him lately. <laughs> uh, and the person would be hiding, you know, in the, in the closet or the floorboards. And my, and my father and the other kids thought it was so strange and they grew up and they realized that um, my grandfather was trying to essentially balance the scales in some way. You're talking about before the Miranda decision, you know, before the right to counsel, before uh, the rights, all the rights that we sort of take for granted now, as we should, because they are guaranteed and they are constitutional, but it was a very, very different world. And it impressed on me what one person can do when you have a very strong sense of justice. Um, and he wasn't making a finding that people had not done something or that they didn't deserve to be held accountable, but he was very much concerned that the process that they might be forced into would not be fair uh, and was not guaranteed to give them a full and fair hearing. So when you took on this new position, you were thrown into the fire over the same question, basically, which is fairness in the criminal justice system. With the spate of police shootings, um, you've had to, or you've decided to make um, visits to communities to start some sort of healing process. Um, at one po point you talk, I thought very powerfully about a kid in, a, in an urban neighborhood who is afraid of the people 
the, the locals who might shoot him, but is equally afraid that if he steps outside, he'll be confused by the police for one of those locals. Um, what have you learned from this community tour you've made? Well, it's been fascinating. I think we are at a point in time in this country where we are seeing um, a conversation develop over a lot of things that are occurring that have been very, very painful to watch, painful to me as someone who's very involved in this system and wants to see it work uh, fairly and freely for everyone. Uh, but we're seeing unfortunate confrontations between law enforcement and civilians. And we're also seeing law enforcement uh, relationships uh, essentially go bad. We're seeing communities lose trust in law enforcement and lose faith in the system. So we're seeing both of those phenomenon together. And I think what we're, the, the unfortunate impact of seeing all of this on video has been that it's tragic and it's chilling, but what we can take from it is we can now fully understand what many minority communities have been saying for a number of years about their experience, about their interaction with the police, and we can open up that dialogue. And it's been a very powerful tool to have these, these interactions captured on tape has been powerful. To have conversations about them has been incredibly powerful. I've been on a six city community policing mm -hmm. tour, as you noted, and I've gone to cities that have had very challenging relationships between the police and law enforcement, either a consent decree or shootings, and they have managed to pull themselves back from those times, and they have really worked to foster a more positive relationship between law enforcement and the community. And our hope is that we can look at cities that have made that commitment and made those efforts and share them with the cities that are still struggling with that now, share them with Baltimore, share them with Ferguson, and other cities where they see this lack of trust as well as the enforcement um, that is not done in the most positive way. Well, there's, and there's you know obvious frustration on the part of communities. There's also frustration on the part of police. And as a former prosecutor, how do you talk to police officers so well, that they feel they're valued and part of the system? Well, I think it's a matter of, of letting them know that they are valued because they are a very important part of the system. I've been fortunate enough throughout my career as a prosecutor to work with some outstanding police officers and federal agents um, who've taught me so much about how to investigate a case how to prosecute a case. And the most important thing that they taught me was how to care about victims, how to care about people who really don't have anyone to speak up for them, who really don't have anyone to turn to uh, when they're not only hurt and frightened, but when they really are in harm's way. And I learned that from some of the best officers and agents in the business. And so when I see this breakdown of trust, um, it's painful to me to see that everyone doesn't have that experience. Uh, and when I talk to law enforcement officers, I talk about those times and I talk about those days. Um, and it, you get the most fascinating stories. I spend a lot of time talking just to the rank and file. So I want to see how they're doing. And I want to talk about the changes that we're seeing in policing now, the focus on community policing, which is a very powerful movement and, and can be a very powerful message to the community. And law enforcement is finding a very powerful tool. And I ask law officers, how long have you been an officer? Why did you want to become a police officer? And they all say some variation of the same thing. They wanted to help people. They either themselves saw domestic violence. One officer told me that when he was a young kid, his stepfather was abusing his mother terribly. And a police officer came in and saved his mother's life. And that's when he knew that's what he wanted to do with his life. And so I think my goal is to try and get that conversation front and center also, and so that people have that relationship with the police uh, to balance out the negative ones that we're seeing uh, and that some people are experiencing. Are police being targeted? Well, I think that a number of people, um, I think violent crime is a factor in all segments of our society. And we have unfortunately seen situations where civilians have been subject to violent crime and police have been subject to violent crime as well. So all loss of life is a tragedy. I think that uh, we have to support our law enforcement officers and focus on empowering them, giving them the tools they need to do the, do the job safely and efficiently. And we also have to empower our communities so that they can build the relationship with law enforcement uh, because it's all about protection. And we're talking about communities that often don't feel that they are protected. The young man that you mentioned uh, was describing a situation where he felt unsafe in his community and unsafe with the police. And the, but the real message of that story is that when he is when he feels unsafe, he doesn't have anyone to call. 
and that's what we have to correct. Since you're in front of a business audience, or mostly business audience, let's talk about a new policy that you have um, you've issued to prosecute individuals yes. uh, for wrongdoing in, in corporate America and to, uh, and to uh, encourage companies to turn over evidence against individuals. You know, when you talk to CEOs on Wall Street, and sometimes, usually behind closed doors, but sometimes publicly, they'll say that under your predecessor, they felt it was a shakedown that they were, they were uh, imposed these massive fines on them for things that they don't believe that they did wrong, but they needed to pay the fine to move past and deal with their shareholders. Um, is the Justice Department sort of going after corporate America? Well, we are following the facts and the evidence where they lead. And where um, either an entity or an individual has caused considerable harm, uh, we will follow the facts and the law to that individual or to that entity. And it, it is our responsibility to hold them accountable for behavior that has significantly harmed um, individuals, citizens, um, people in this country. And when I was in private practice, I often had similar discussions with some of my clients. And what I realized is that sometimes there is this disconnect between what law enforcement and corporate America say and how they understand each other. And I would spend time talking to my clients who would say, we feel unfairly targeted. We feel that this is just a way to, to get a big fine out of us. Um, don't they care about the people that they might put out of business? And I would have to talk about my time as a prosecutor and the focus on protecting people from uh, criminal conduct, particularly corporate conduct, which can have wide-ranging and far-reaching circumstances, the government's obligation to speak for the victims of crime, and our real desire um, that corporate America be accountable and hold themselves responsible, whether it's through a strong compliance program, through, uh, through themselves policing wrongdoers, um, that our goal was to essentially get corporate America to be good corporate citizens and to deal with these as well. And so it wasn't a personal targeting. Um, and so I'd have these discussions uh, with my own clients as well. So I understand the sentiment there. Our new individual accountability policy is really a way of focusing our efforts on not just the corporate entity, but individuals who make decisions that cause great harm and that lead to criminal liability for the company and for themselves. And essentially it says that for companies that want to cooperate with the government, we start with an investigation that focuses on individuals who have in fact uh, contributed to or directed the, 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 the actions mm -hmm. that led to criminal culpability. Um, and that to get credit for cooperation, that has to be a part of the equation. It's telling the complete story. It is essentially um, holding everyone accountable. And is our hope that companies will look at this as a way that they can strengthen their own compliance, um, that they can themselves focus on individuals who may not have the best interests of the company at heart. Many times we see situations where individuals deliberately circumvent corporate controls and take the company down a particular path. I've had cases like that as well. So what's your one sentence message to corporate America today on, on this? To, to corporate America that uh, we want you to focus on responsibility, on accountability, and making sure that anyone who is behaving in a way that takes your company down a path of criminal activity uh, be not a part of the process uh, and that it's something that we'll be taking very seriously. Cyber theft is a big um, part of what your uh, portfolio is yeah. now. What are you doing to protect uh, American companies? You know, cyber theft is a huge problem because of um, the potential loss of our valuable intellectual property at the corporate level as well as personal data at the individual level. And it is another way in which we're looking to work very closely with corporate America on resolving these problems. We've got a lot of um, groups in government set up at the investigative level that when we learn of a breach, we alert corporate America as soon as possible. And we've been working on improving the response time there. It used to because be because usually you get a call from yes. the FBI if you're a CEO. That's how you find out that you've been hacked. Yes, and we it used to be say I'd say in the past couple of years that the FBI or the Secret Service would say we have information. There's been an intrusion, um, and it was sometime maybe a few weeks ago, and we're working on the data. And now we are to the point where we can we can call you within days, um, sometimes hours really? of okay. that happening, and we say to you, this is what we're seeing. 
we need to talk to you, we'd like to sit down with you and work out a way to, number one, stop this infiltration, and more importantly, stop the exfiltration of data. We lose so many valuable uh, technologies, the fruits of our intellectual labor, the best minds in America working on some of the hardest problems. This is technology, this is thought that needs to stay here uh, for the benefit of all of us. So you came to worldwide attention early in your short tenure um, with the FIFA investigation. <laughs> um, it, as they called it in a German newspaper, the FIFA hunt. Um, <laughs> did you, um, what, what was your thinking of, about going forward on this case that frankly is not directly on American turf, right? So um, did you hesitate about going forward on that? Well, you know, it's an open case, so there's not a lot I can say. I can say that, in our view, it is very much on American turf. You know, as we have set forth in the charges, uh, the allegation is that individuals uh, who ran FIFA used the American financial system to further a system of bribery that went on for decades uh, about the handling of television rights and other corporate rights that were very, very valuable. Millions of dollars of money was essentially extorted from different companies and taken in bribes. Um, by responsible individuals at FIFA. That's essentially the gravamen of the charges that we've laid out. Uh, the investigation is continuing, it's ongoing, and when you use the American financial system to carry out a large-scale, massive international fraud, you will get the attention of American law mm -hmm, enforcement mm -hmm. and you will get the results of American law enforcement. Spoken like a true prosecutor. <laughs> <laughs> You are also intent on making headway on the human trafficking problem. Describe the problem and describe what you're doing. Well, it was a problem I first saw as a U.S. attorney in Brooklyn with a number of cases that manifested themselves either as young women from overseas, either Eastern Europe or Mexico, brought to this country with promises of jobs, employment, basically a better life, many times brought here with the promise of a romantic relationship with someone and then when they came to this country, we're told that in order to have anything at all, um, they essentially were forced into a life of prostitution. Um, and so women who are in this situation often don't speak the language. They are hidden. Um, they feel as if they have no one to turn to. We were able to work with a number of non-governmental organizations or NGOs in the area who deal with survivors, who work with survivors and find them support. And when a woman was brave enough to actually escape, uh, they would often come to us and say, can you help this woman? And from that, we were able to develop a series of cases based on this fact pattern. And the most insidious thing about this particular fact pattern was for many of these women, the reason why they stayed entrapped in this forced labor, sexual slavery, when people would wonder, well, you're far away from home, you're far away from the trafficker, why not just escape and run to the police? was that they often had children, either on their own or sometimes with the men who brought them to, the, to this country, and their children were back home in Mexico, and they were basically told, if you don't do what we say, if you don't continue this behavior, you'll never see your children again. Wow. And as we all know, women will do anything for their children. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, this was one of the most insidious, pernicious, frankly, most evil crimes I had seen. Mm -hmm. um, and as I looked into it, and the prevalence throughout the country. It is one of How the How prevalent is it? You know, it's one of the most invisible crimes we have, yet one of the most widespread. So the numbers on it aren't that good because many people are afraid to come forward. But it's in urban areas, it's in rural areas. In my home state of North Carolina, they have a very strong focus on fighting this because apparently North Carolina is 10th in the nation wow. with instances of human trafficking. So it's something that I saw then, uh, and I think anything that leads to the degradation of people is so antithetical to who we are and what we are as a country that we cannot countenance it. We, we simply cannot allow this to happen. This is not who we are, not in America. So when you look towards the end of your tenure, which is unfortunately not that far away, <laughs> because, um, what is the legacy that you want to leave and how much of it is drawn from lessons, life lessons you learned either as a prosecutor or growing up uh, in that small town with your fabulous parents? Well, as I mentioned before, the lesson I learned from my parents and from my, from my grandfather was that justice is a process uh, and that everyone needs to feel that they can participate in it and that they have a voice and that they can be heard. We're doing a lot of things at the Justice Department to make sure that our criminal justice system is not only the most efficient, but also the most fair that it can be. 
We're working on sentencing reform. We're working on reentry programs because when describe the sen sentencing reform briefly. Please. Well, we're very. It's. I think we're at a very positive moment in this country. We bipartisan have very, moment. Very strong bipartisan support for some relief from the collateral consequences of some harsh sentencing choices we made years ago. Now, I was a young prosecutor in the 90s. I remember the drug war. I remember the violence that it, that it engendered. And I think that at the time, people thought that was the best way to keep us safe, mm -hmm. was to essentially have long sentences, long mandatory minimums. But what we've seen over time is that it swept into its net a whole host of nonviolent offenders who were not the kingpins, were not the leaders and organizers that we were trying to catch in that net. We spend a lot of time going after those people, and that continues, and they will continue to get the, the long sentences that they deserve. But when we look at the damage caused by the over-incarceration, particularly of minority young men and women, to communities and families, that's not the goal, and that's not where our criminal justice system needs to be today. So my goal is, I hope to leave the Justice Department a place where people look at it and say that uh, this Justice Department made the system more fair, more accessible, and helped to restore the connection that everyone should feel to the protective forces of their government. Well, Attorney General Lynch, we're lucky to have you in that position. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.